Settings for Life. As you know, if you've been watching with us, we are doing a fresh look at the Ten Commandments, and that's found in Exodus 20. And the writer is paralleling that with David's life, which is a man after God's own heart. Um, today we're on the last session, session six, and the title of today's lesson is Honor All Relationships. And the point that the writer brings out today is that integrity and contentment in Christ form the foundation for good relationships. So that's what we'll look at today, how that we need to have integrity and contentment in our lives in order to have good relationships with other people. And the writer started off with a good illustration of the implosion of an infrastructure. Like you have this building there and then one minute it's you know nice and solid and this great strong building and then within seconds it collapses the entire structure falls apart and collapses into just a pile of debris and the writer tries to relate this to our lives and he says that it only takes a second for our relationships to implode just like a building would we can do these things by stealing from someone else, by making strong accusations against someone else, and just by being discontent in our own lives. And so those are some things we'll look at today to wrap up the Ten Commandments. Now remember, the last six commandments that we've been looking at deals with our relationships with other people. And these last three that we're looking at today, they specifically address the right actions towards other people and their property and their reputation. And those things stem from our own lack of contentment. Now, centuries after these were written, David writes a psalm that deals directly with what we're looking at today, and that is Psalms 37. So we'll also be looking at that Psalm this morning too. In Exodus chapter 20, verses 15 to 16 is where we begin. So I'll read those to you. He says, do not steal, do not give false testimony against your neighbor. So what does it mean to steal? Well, in our English dictionary, the Merriam-Webster dictionary, to steal means to take something from someone without permission. But if you look at the Hebrew interpretation, which is what the Bible, the Old Testament, was translated from, I can't pronounce the name, I'm not even going to try, but it's spelled G-A-N-A-V. And this refers to the act of theft, just like our dictionary said, it also refers to a deceptive inner disposition, like self-deception. And I, I found a really good article. I've tried to look at a few commentaries dealing with this particular um, commandment, do not steal, because I, there's so much more than just stealing here, than just taking something that somebody has or that you want and you don't have, whether that be from their home, um, from a store, whatever. I knew there was something more to this command than just do not steal. So I went looking and I found something, um, a great article, it's called Hebrews for Christians. And John Parsons, he had a quote in there that I wanted to just read to you. He says, stealing is an act based on fear. Since the attitude behind the action evidences a lack of trust that God will meet all of our needs. That just really hit home that stealing is actually an action that we take when we don't feel like God's gonna meet our needs, whether that's a tangible item that we take or stealing someone's mind, as we'll look at in just a minute, trying to control and manipulate the situation. Exodus 21 verse 16, and Deuteronomy 24 verse 7, you can find this Hebrew word. And this Hebrew word for steal actually means kidnapping in these two verses. So one interpretation of stealing is actually kidnapping a person. And Genesis chapter 31, this word is also used, this G 
A and a B word. It's also used twice in Genesis 31, actually. One of the times it's used is in verse 20. And it's when Jacob stole Laban's daughters from him. He didn't actually like steal the daughters away. He was married to them. He had children, he had grandchildren, um, Laban's grandchildren. So Jacob plotted to leave Laban and take Laban's daughters, even though he was married to them, and go away, get away from Laban, from how he treated him. So he, the writer says, in a sense, Jacob stole Laban's mind by manipulating him and by twisting the situation. The other way it's used in Genesis chapter 31 is when Rachel, actually, when they were getting things together to leave and they knew they were leaving, she stole her father Laban's idols. And then when Laban meets back up with him later on, she's sitting on the idols and lies about her disposition at the moment as a woman and was able to conceal the idols even further. So twice here in this chapter, this Hebrew form is used. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> so those are two different ways, even in just you know, Genesis chapter 31, that that particular verb is used. So it can mean taking another person or kidnapping. It can mean taking items by theft, which is the natural way we think when we read do not steal. It can mean to deceive someone, which is how um, Jacob deceived Laban by sneaking away in the middle of the night. He stole his mind. He tricked him. He fooled him. He gave him the wrong impression. And that's what this word, this verb means. An example of us using this verb, this steal word, to steal someone's mind, so to speak, would be like offering to pay a bill at dinner. When you're in a group of, of friends and you know that the guy over there makes a little bit more than you, and more than likely he's gonna take up everybody's tab, but you're just trying to be generous. So you said, I'll get the bill, I'll get the bill, but you know he's gonna take it up. So that's a form of manipulation. It's a fake impression of generosity. Another way that this term could be used is to in invite someone to a party knowing that they can't come. Like you really didn't want to invite them, but you invite them anyway, because you really know they can't come because they had something else and they've already told you they have something else or their friend did or whatever. So this is a way you're manipulating the situation. Another form that this could be used in, an example in today's world, is take credit for something we don't do. That's another way that we can steal. So to deceive ourselves, to steal from the truth, is another way we can deceive not only other people, but we deceive ourselves. We steal our own minds. We rationalize the things that are unjust. We rob ourselves of inner peace. We begin dwelling on all the things that's going wrong and all the things that are going on around us and we steal our own minds. We steal our own peace. So this Hebrew interpretation is more than just taking something that isn't ours, walking into the gas station and grabbing a piece of gum, putting it in your pocket and walking out the door. It's way more than just theft by taking. It's even deeper. It's could possibly mean kidnapping, that's a form of it, um, theft by taking, but also manipulating people's minds and manipulating your own mind. So those are some ways that it's used. Um, then he talks about in these verses, false testimony, do not give false testimony against your neighbor. Well, Jesus said in John 14, six, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And in John eight forty four. Satan is called the father of lies. So we are responsible to be truthful at all times because if you're a believer and Jesus dwells within you, his Holy Spirit dwells within you, then you should be truthful at all times. Now this false testimony that we read about in the Ten Commandments refers to a court or a judicial system but we are to live lives of integrity all the time, not just when we go to court and we have to tell the truth. 
about a situation that's going on. We should live these lives of integrity everywhere we go. Now, we're going to read verse 17 in Exodus 20, the last command. It says, Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female slave, his ox or donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Who is your neighbor? Everybody. Jesus said, love your neighbor. And your neighbor is everybody. I think we've already covered that several times if you've listened to any of these Bible Studies for Life lessons. But just so we hit the nail on the head, neighbor is anyone. He says here, don't covet. Covet is a verb. It means to yearn, to possess, or have something without regard to the rights or feelings of another person. Now, the Hebrew root word for covet is command. And this means to desire, to take pleasure in, to lust for. He says, do not lust for your neighbor's marital partner, your neighbor's servants, your neighbor's ox or donkey, or anything really. Don't lust after or covet anything that your neighbor has. Now, when we become discontent with who we are or where we are in life and what we have, we risk losing what we have. We also risk stealing and taking. And that's how these all tie together. The writer was trying to pull all this together with these last three today. Because it really comes down to Exodus 20 verse 17. When we covet what our neighbor has, and that's anybody, or want or desire or lust for any of that stuff, then we put ourselves in a position to commit adultery, commit murder, steal, any of those other commandments that we've already looked at. It all comes back to coveting. Now, advertisers really monopolize on this particular verse. They know who we are. We are covetous people. They spend millions and millions of dollars making us dissatisfied. And we watch it, and we consume it, and we become dissatisfied. They hit the nail on the head with all their advertisement. When we are discontent, we fall for that sales pitch. There are times you can look at a commercial and be like, that's that's not even true. That's not even right. And you can recognize it. You have that sense of discernment. And you turn it off. You get away from it and flee from it. But there's other times you see those commercials, those new cars, the new gadgets, the HGTV. I mean, don't even watch that stuff because, I mean, you, you're going to start coveting all that stuff. And you look at it and you're like, my house doesn't look like that. My car doesn't look like that. Not that those things are bad in and of themselves, but if you dwell on it and you soak it all in, your heart becomes bitter and upset and you start coveting. Um, contentment is realizing that God has met our needs and responding to that with gratitude. Our mindset is acknowledging the goodness of God and that all we have is from Him and resting in that security that we have in Him. We live in chronic covetousness. We're not happy unless we're taking the next step up the ladder. We're not happy unless we're constantly obtaining more and more and more. Whatever it is, it could be the candy bars, it could be the rugs, it could be the cars, whatever it is for you is in particular, it might be a $2 item. But if it's something you're just constantly coveting after, that's where we get discontent. And when we are discontent, it leads to lying and scheming and manipulating and being slanderous toward other people in order to get our way and in order to get ahead in life. Kind of sounds like a political commercial. Right now, they're just everywhere. I don't watch a whole lot of TV. Um, we don't have it. We have some, I mean, we do have TV, but it's not like 
not like you turn on the cable or the satellite. It's like Hulu Live and stuff like that. So we don't get a whole lot of commercials unless you're watching a football game because that's about all we watch other than a movie or something. But the few um, political commercials that I've seen or maybe I've heard on the radio, it's ridiculous. It, instead of speaking of what that particular candidate has to offer, instead of telling the world what you have to offer them, they twist it and start slandering their opponent when it should be the other way around because when we are discontent with ourselves we slander other people and we go after them to make us look better to make us feel better whatever the situation is but we've got to be so careful that we don't sound like a political commercial that we're not constantly slandering and putting down other people in order to build ourselves up because that's not the way you do it. You just, you are who you are and you can offer what you can and then just let it be that what it is. Now, how can we prevent coveting? Because it is such a problem. It is such an issue. It is with me, definitely. I know it is. So there are things I have to guard against. So how can we prevent it? can't really prevent it necessarily except when you recognize it stay away from it because it's everywhere but some of the ways we can help avoid being covetous is have an attitude of gratitude you've probably heard that in Sunday school probably a song about it my mom probably knows a song about it um, have the attitude of thankfulness whatever it is that you have look around you and be thankful for it and I think I've said this in the last thing. I know, I figure, I feel like I have because I know we tell our kids this all the time. Quit looking down. I mean, quit looking up the ladder and start looking down the ladder. Instead of chasing everything your friends have and, well, I don't have the new phone and I don't have the new car and I don't have the new shoes. Instead of looking up and trying to f figure out how you can get more, start looking down and realize you are blessed where you are. And how can you help pull other people up the ladder instead of just climbing and climbing? Because when you start climbing, you start stepping all over people. Psalm 37 verses 1 through 6. I'm going to read it. We're really not going to discuss it a whole lot um, because it's pretty self-explanatory. So I'm going to read it for us. These are David, David's words here. Do not be agitated by evildoers. Do not envy those who do wrong. For they wither quickly like grass and wither like tender green plants. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and gifts and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. Making your righteousness shine like the dawn. Your justice like the noonday. So these are David's words here. He says, don't envy wrongdoers. Instead, seek after God. Take pleasure in God and in who He is. And His desires will become your desires. And instead of trying to figure out how we can climb up the ladder, we'll be content with where we are because we know who we are in Him and we can rest securely in that. Thank you for listening. We start a new um, we're still in the same book, but we will start a new uh, lesson series next week. I have not looked ahead, so I don't even know what it is, but that's what will be in next week. So if you have access to the church, you can go grab a book um, in the four-year area and catch up, read it, and be right there with us next week. I'm going to pray and we'll close. God, help us to understand what it really means to live lives of integrity and contentment in our interactions with other people. In your name we pray, amen.